Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up later in the show, we'll profile Christy Becker of Cold Spring, Minnesota, a stained glass artist. But first, Doug Hamilton had a chance to sit down and talk with Frank Abagnale Jr. Frank Abagnale, thanks for joining us on Prairie Pulse. Uh, Frank Abagnale is an author, a lecturer, and a financial fraud consultant. Well, we also live in a, in a brave new world here of social media where a lot of our identifying <laughs> information is readily available to somebody who wants to do even a cursory search of Facebook or, or some other social media platform. Absolutely. I'm not on any social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. I don't do any of those things. But that is why we're seeing such sophisticated phishing scams now. So the kind of scams we see now is an email that says, Hi, Karen. Great having lunch with you today. We need to do that again more often. I hope you and your husband, Robert, have a great time at Disney World with the kids this week. When you get back, give me a call. We'll do lunch again. By the way, I saw this on YouTube and I thought you'd enjoy it. Here's the link. Uh, signed, Joan. Uh, that's because she already said on Facebook she was going to lunch. She already said her friend's name. She said her husband's name several times. They said they were going to Disney World. They use all of that to establish credibility so that when you get that email, you think this must be, who else would it be? It must be my friend. So yes, there's a tremendous amount of information given away on social media. If you tell someone on social media, whether it be Facebook or whatever it might be, where you were born and your date of birth, that's 98% I need to steal your identity. I only need to know those two things. So if on your Facebook page you told me that, that's all I need to know. If you post a straight photograph of yourself on Facebook, I can capture that image of you. I can use it on phony identification. And also through facial recognition, they can research your photo and go to your Facebook page through facial recognition. So I always tell young people, you know, you're gonna put a photo up there, you put a photo of you and your friends and your arms around them, you're playing soccer, you have your dog, you don't have a straight on uh, photograph of yourself. I also remind a lot of young people that what you say on Facebook stays on Facebook. Whether you erase it, delete it, or you close your account, it'll always be there. So if the government's going to hire you tomorrow, they are going to your Facebook page. And if there's a picture of you nude on the beach with a bunch of drug paraphernalia all over your body and wine bottles and whiskey bottles, they're not going to hire you. If you're 12 years old and you make a racial slur, your employer will read it when you're 21. University of North Dakota will read it at admissions. If you say something about someone's sexual orientation because you're 14 and don't know any better, someone's going to read it. So I always remind young people, before you post, before you say something, you need to ask yourself, do I want someone to read this five years from now, uh, 10 years from now? Because they will. Well, you mentioned you don't have any social media identity out there, but everybody seems to have some sort of an online relationship that requires a password. How safe is a password? I mean, some people use the word password or one, two, three, four, five, six. How safe are the ways that we try to protect our security online? Great question. First of all, uh, passwords are for tree houses. It is just absurd that we are using passwords today. Passwords are actually a 1964 technology before I ever did anything that we're using in 2018. So have you read a lot of things that I've written over the years? Uh, it's simply trying to get away from passwords. Uh, we, we need to eliminate the use of passwords. So for the last five years, I've worked as an advisor to a technology company called TrueSona, which is out in Scottsdale, Arizona. It stands for true persona of a person. And TrueSona is a technology that does, in fact, eliminate the need for uh, passwords. So within the next couple of years, two or three years, you will see passwords go away. Uh, big financial institutions are adopting that technology. Governments are adopting the technology. And so when you go up to an ATM, you will basically just have your phone. And when you pull up, you will not need a card. You will not need a password. You will be able to just simply pull up your phone, press your app for your bank, and up will come a little dot on the screen. You'll hold your phone up, and they'll know it's, know it's you. You won't have to enter any passwords. A Delta, for example, is using that now, but there are 80,000 employees. There's no passwords between their employees and the company. So they vet it, and then they will eventually put it out into the market for their millions of applying customers. However, they will always start out by saying to you on your home screen, 
do you want to use a password? No, uh, you, no password. So you'll have the option of using your password or not using your password, but eventually I think you'll see the whole password go away, and we, we absolutely need to do that. We need to get rid of passwords. Well, some banks or some institutions these days are using biometrics like a, a, a fingertip or facial recognition. I'm not a big fan on biometrics, and I'll explain why. Um, if I take a picture of you on your iPhone 10 and your image, or I take your fingerprint or I take your eye scan, biometrics means that I've taken that digital image and I've converted it to numbers and letters, a series of long numbers and letters. If I can capture those long numbers and letters, then I can replay them again and do the same thing. I can become you. I can be the retina. I can be the fingerprint. I can be you on the iPhone. Uh, we know replay is a very common thing. So for example, when TruSona was invented, the people at TruSona, when I got involved with them, I said, unless you first start out by inventing anti-replay, which no one has done, uh, don't even go down this path. Because as long as I can replay whatever it is you did on your phone, I can be you. So the whole concept was to develop anti-replay, and that's what we did first, and then we developed TruSona. So uh, biometrics can be replayed, just like a wire the bank sends. A company sends a wire tomorrow, their CFO, for $20 million. I capture that wire data. I can replay it again and resend another $20 million. So you have to have anti-replay technology to prevent that. And in biometrics, uh, we don't have that. You mentioned that uh, financial institutions typically have the, the highest level of security these days. We have had some uh, really fundamentally troubling breaches. Equifax, for example, sort of backs up financial institutions with very important data. Uh, is it realistic to think that my data isn't out there already somewhere? Just oh, no, I, I think it is. I believe that everyone's information's already been stolen. We've had billions, literally billions of dollars, uh, billions of uh, personal names and information breached. I am a strong believer that every breach occurs because somebody in that company did something they weren't supposed to do or somebody in that company failed to do something they were supposed to do. Hackers actually don't cause breaches. People do. So in the case of Equifax, they failed to update their internal uh, system. They failed to fix uh, and import their patches that Microsoft sent them and told them to install. They did a horrible job of doing the uh, security infrastructure, and consequently, they allowed hackers uh, to get in. And like in every breach, it always starts out with a low number. They said 140 million, then it was 142 million, then 145 million, now it's 148 million. Uh, you know, it's probably more than 200 million pieces of information and data have been stolen from Equifax. And that's just one of many breaches. Uh, you know, we have Yahoo, it had a half a billion breaches. Uh, there have been so many names and information, one would have to assume that their identity has already uh, been stolen and out there. Uh, but yes, but I always remind people that every breach occurs for that reason. I kind of felt that uh, the whole Equifax thing, uh, the, what they did post their breach was a little bit unethical. So first of all, they immediately came out and said that they will provide one year of credit monitoring service for free. So millions of people that were, went and signed up for Equifax credit monitoring service. Then as the year passed, they came back and said, well, nothing's really came up yet, so we suggest you sign up for the service. It's $15 a month or $20 a month. So they made millions and millions of dollars. Uh, so I, didn't, I, think that, I thought that was very unethical. Those types of breaches, we usually find about a four-year lag because they warehouse that information. So in reality, we haven't even begun to see what's going to happen with Equifax and the information that was stolen. What's really bad about all of this is whether it be Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, you never gave the Credit Bureau permission to have your information. You've now spent more than 40 years working with FBI agents in training and other federal agencies. How many uh, professionals' lives do you think you've you've touched over those? Well, I know that I've, I've taught more than two generations of FBI agents. We have 13,000 FBI agents. Uh, many of them all retired today that are very close friends of mine that are retired agents I taught when they went through the academy. Uh, agents have to retire at 57 years old. So I, 
I've met many of agents who are now retired. My son is an FBI agent. He's celebrating 12 years in the Bureau. Uh, I taught him. He was in my class when he went through the academy. Uh, so yes, uh, I was recently um, on my website, I have a little clip from uh, a U.S. Senate committee of about 12 senators uh, interviewing me and the senator from Oklahoma mentioned about that I had tra trained two generations of FBI agents during my career and that it's, that's uh, been a wonderful thing for me. The FBI has had some problems in its past. It was a bit problematic around the Hoover years. And now there is concern about uh, whether or not the FBI is following certain ethical guidelines in its dealings. Uh, how does that concern you? Well, you know, like in every, in every organization, there are a few bad people. I, I truly believe that you cannot be involved uh, politically. You can have your political thoughts. You cannot let them interfere in your work. Uh, the 13,000 agents that are out there, uh, they, they don't let politics interfere in their work. I think this was a handful of people who obviously now have been fired and dismissed, but who let politics get involved with their decision making and, and that was wrong. And uh, you can't become political and uh, obviously you have to serve whatever president the public uh, puts in place. They're your president, you have to serve the president whether you like them, don't like them, don't believe in their politics. Uh, that's not your decision to make as an FBI agent. And when you investigate a crime, you investigate the crime based on facts and information you've gotten. And as for the FBI and their over 100 year uh, history, their sole job, as they remind people all the time, is only an investigative arm of the Department of Justice. So they investigate the crime, they bring the evidence to the U.S. Attorney, or in this case, the Attorney General, say here's all the evidence, and the Attorney General or the U.S. Attorney makes a decision whether to prosecute or not prosecute. So in my personal opinion, the director Comey should have never ever made those statements. It was not his place to make those statements. He should have simply said to the Attorney General, I'm not doing that, that's not my job, and if you force me to do it, I'll resign, and that'll look even worse if I tell people why I resign. I think that was, that was where it all started, the mistake. He, he should have never done that. I think he was a little more political. Uh, I not only knew Director Mueller very well, but I traveled with Director Mueller. Uh, he's a fine, ethical gentleman. Uh, I never once did I see him in front of a camera. He avoided the news media. He didn't talk to the press. If we were at a conference, I would go speak with the press. He didn't go speak with the press. Uh, he was very much the director of the Bureau, and that's the way it should be. He didn't get involved in comments politically or otherwise. So I think it's just a, it was a change in directors, and that was a problem, and I think hopefully they'll get this all cleared up. But it, no reflection on the 13,000 agents, men and women, who do their job every day. Well, again, you're in North Dakota to talk about fraud, uh, particularly that that's perpetrated on senior citizens, and you'll be talking to business owners as well. We live in an age of... Uh, security where we are online to bank and online to make purchases. Uh, what should we know about our online presence that should concern us? Okay, well first of all make sure that uh, you shred everything. Okay, so you got a catalog yesterday from Macy's, you looked at it, wasn't anything you wanted, so you threw it away. But on the back cover of the catalog was your name and address, your barcode, source code, ID number. That's all I need to become you. So you want to shred that. You went to the grocery store and you wrote a check. On the check was your name and address, phone number, bank's name and address, account number at your bank, routing number into your account, that's your wiring instructions, signature on the signature card at your bank. Then the clerk wrote down your North Dakota driver's license number and your date of birth on the front. You don't get the check back. We live in truncation, so you get an image of the check. The check goes to that company's headquarters in Chicago where it sits in a warehouse for 65 days and then they physically destroy it. Anyone who would see the face of that check could draft on your bank account, wire money out of your account. So I don't get over paranoid. I'm a little old fashioned. I write a check to pay the mortgage or I write a check to pay a loan, but I'm very careful about where I write a check because I'm actually handing someone information with all my banking information on it, a piece, piece of paper. Um, I don't own a debit card. I've never owned one, never allowed my three sons to have one. A long time ago, while writing a book on financial security, 
I asked myself, how would someone remove 99.9% .9 of their risk? And the answer was to use the safest form of payment that exists on the face of the earth, and that is a credit card. Credit card, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover card. Not a debit credit, but a credit card. And every day of my life, I spend the credit card company's money. I never spend my money. My money sits in a money market account, it earns interest. No one knows where it is because it's not exposed to anyone. I only expose the credit card company's money. I will do everything I can to protect the card, but if someone gets my number and they charge a million dollars on my credit card tomorrow, by federal law, my liability is zero. I have no liability. If I buy something online and use my credit card and they don't deliver it, I'm covered. If I buy something online and it comes broken, they refuse to take it back, I'm covered. If I buy something online from a fictitious website because I don't know it's fictitious and I never get it, I'm covered. Every time I pay my bill or part of my bill every month, my credit score goes up. So I keep building credit on my credit score. When you use a debit card, every time you reach for it, you're exposing the money in your bank account. The only money going to steal is your money. So in every post-investigation, Target, Home Depot, every one of those came down to the simple question, what happened? Well, I had a Visa card at Target, so they just canceled my card. I think two days later, FedEx delivered me a new card. That was the last I heard about it. Oh no, I had a debit card and it took $3,000 out of my checking account, and it took me two months to get the $3,000 back while the bank said they were investigating it. Uh, you do nothing for your credit score whatsoever. If you could use that debit card 20 times a day for 20 years, your credit will not move this much. So I had three sons that went off to college. I said to them, I'm not giving you a debit card. I've actually applied for a credit card in your name. So it's your card. Of course, you're 18, you have no credit, so I had to guarantee the card. And that means three things will happen. One, the bill comes to me, I'm responsible for the bill. So if you're spending a lot of time in the bar, I'm going to know it. Two, uh, every time I pay the bill, it's going to go on your credit. So five years from now, four years from now, when you graduate from college, you should have a credit score of about 800. You want to buy a car, buy a house? But you can do that without me. You don't need me to do that for you. And of course, I control the limit on the card. So whatever I think you need to spend every month, that'll be the limit of the card. One of the best things you can do for your children is to teach them early on to build credit in their name. We have a lot of young people now only use a debit card. They graduate from college. They come back to Fargo. They get a beautiful job. They go down to rent an apartment. They fill out the lease. And the manager says, son, you have no credit. You don't even have a credit file with the credit bureau. So you're gonna to have to have your parents co-sign the lease. So one of the best things you can do is teach them to build credit. You know, 30 years ago, credit was all about, do I get the car, do I get the home? Everything today, everything literally, is based on your credit. So if you apply for a job, they check your credit. You apply for auto insurance, they check your credit. Life insurance, they check your credit. No, health insurance, they check your credit. No matter what it is, open a bank account, they check your credit. So everything is based on your credit and it's very important to teach young people to build credit uh, and uh, use that credit. And then finally, I would say freeze your credit. And if you don't want to freeze your credit, then use a credit monitoring service. They're like $13, $15 a month. Companies like LifeLock, Privacy Guard, where they monitor your credit for you and notify you in real time if someone's attempting to use your name, social security number, date of birth, or some of that personal information so you can do something about it. Uh, you have to be proactive, you can't be reactive. This is not 30 years ago. You have to be a smarter consumer today. You certainly have to be a smarter businessman today. So you cannot rely on the government, you cannot rely on the bank, you cannot rely on the police to protect you. You have to learn to protect yourself and take the steps necessary to do that. Frank Abagnale, thank you for joining us on Prairie Falls. Thanks, Doug, my pleasure. Christy Becker of Cold Spring, Minnesota is a stained glass artist. As a child attending mass, the stained glass windows mesmerized her with their dazzling colors and light. Now, Christy collaborates with Terhar Stained Glass Studio and uses that inspiration to create beautiful windows for churches and other venues to share that light that she first saw. Somebody once referred to stained glass as painting with light, and that's really what you are doing. 
My mom is an artist and she did a lot of different jobs while I was growing up. She lettered signs, she drew portraits, she painted pictures, and I always knew I wanted to be an artist just like her. I watched her and I learned from her. I started drawing portraits in high school. I went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, got my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Industrial Design. I used to do commissioned graphite portraits for people and carried that over into diamond etching on granite. The reason why I was so intrigued and really grabbed onto the glass painting is because we went to mass three times a week. I stared at those stained glass windows, thinking about who the artist was who designed those windows, why they chose those colors, why they did this, why they didn't do that. The sunlight would come through the windows so beautifully. I've always wanted to just spread that light that I saw. Tierhar Stained Glass Studio is the studio that I work with in Minnesota. I stopped by one day to get a stained glass window for my parents. I started talking with Gary. I brought in my portfolio and he liked what he saw and said he needed a painter and I had never painted on glass before, had no idea what it entailed. I delved right into the painting and learned a lot on my own. Gary knew some things enough for me to get started. I've been painting for him for about 14 years. I'm still trying to perfect my recipe for colors and process and layering what works best for me for my style. The way it works with us is Gary talks with whoever it is who contacts him. He discusses with me a little bit about where the church is, what they're looking for, how many windows it may be. I do sometimes incorporate the architectural aspects of the church with the window. If they have existing stained glass windows, do they want those to coordinate with the new windows? Gary and I go to the church or the parish and meet with the people. We listen to what they are thinking. Do you want them traditional? Do you want them contemporary? Do you want movement? Do you want it to be inspiring? Do you want images? Do you want symbols? I write down what words they come up with. We want it to be peaceful. We want it to be meditative. We want it to glow or be inspiring, spiritual, nature. They might want something more didactic with the story or Jesus and the apostles. Sometimes I'll do a great design that I just love, but I'll add color to it and it just doesn't look the same to me. So I learned how to design a good window with lines and line work, always thinking of color as I'm designing it. It makes a big difference. Once the illustration is okayed, I get the dimensions of the window, put that in my computer, enlarge my illustration to that size and print out eight and a half by 11 sheets. And then I tape all those pieces of paper together. I have a drawing laying on my table at home. I put my piece of glass on my drawing and do all my trace lines. Those are done with a calligraphy pen and I use oil and the paint is actually a powder and you mix it with a palette knife. I get all my thin lines done and then I fire it. After it's fired, I turn my piece over and I do just a flat mat on the back with water base and the paint, and then it dries and it turns back to powder. So then what you do is you lift the powder off the glass. I usually do stippling. So I have some really soft brushes that I will stipple onto the face and it pulls the powder off. I would fire it after that first mat my second mat on the back side, I would do all shadowed areas, and then I fire it again. And then I flip it over to my front side and start working on that. And then I fire it, and then I do all my shadowing. I do two layers on the back, four layers on the front. And I just love adding that eye color because I'm working with the face for so long. You just can't wait to put that color in the eyes because it really is what makes them look alive. I want to be able to inspire them like I was inspired growing up by so many beautiful stained glass windows. I want them to be able to look at the windows I design and see something different every time or feel different. 
if they're not in a good place to be able to look at the window and stare at it and meditate on it and to feel good after looking at it and seeing something beautiful. My art is what makes me tick. My desire to do art, my passion for art, and my faith. Faith in God, but also faith in myself. I believe in myself. I know I've been given a gift. Tara Harstein Glass gave me a great opportunity to be able to share that because I can share my faith, I can share the light, I can share my creativity. I love it. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.